Now, so to our next story, uh, Galway fans of the 90s will most likely remember our next guest. Justin Campbell played in the forwards for Galway. He was beaten in one All-Ireland final against Kilkenny in 1993. He was an All-Ireland winner at under-21 level in 91. Away from the hurling pitch, life was not straightforward. At the youngest of six, he lost both his parents young. He was just 10 when his father passed away. Four years later, his mother fell sick. Cancer in both instances, the fallout naturally meant he had his own battles to fight away from the hurling pitch. These days, he helps others work through their issues. He took various qualifications in the areas of counselling and psychotherapy. And after working at different treatment centres, he runs his own private practice. Justin Campbell, real pleasure to speak to you. You're very welcome. Thanks very much, Joe. So listen, loads to talk to you about. We might start with your private practice and and life uh, these days. So uh, when did you first become attracted to the idea of of, of spending your days helping others? Um, I suppose uh, through my own pathway in life, I, I, um, you know, had a a rocky road at the start and, uh, you know, got eventually got myself uh, to face face my own demons and look in the mirror and um, as a result of that I you know I liked working with people and, and decided to go down the pathway of uh, counselling and psychotherapy uh, I presume a, a very emotionally taxing profession you must on, on routine days I come across very distressing uh, stories, uh, progress, I'm sure, can be slow. How do you uh, maintain some kind of life balance? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, I suppose it helps sometimes when you've walked that path yourself. Um, and, you know, through my own supervision and through my own support mechanisms, you know, we deal, we deal with that. Most therapists have their own uh, supervisor and we go to supervision. And I suppose, you know, you get away from it and, you know, you have, I luckily enough, have sport and different things like that to deal with it as well. But I suppose that's where your training comes in as a psychotherapist and a counsellor that you, 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 you know, you're able to deal with these issues and problems as they come in the door. And so, because I, I haven't talked to too many therapists on the show, as you might imagine, over the years, does that extend to keeping a very emotionally distant relationship on your side with your patients are you are you allowed to bond with them and like them and uh, be very fond of them yeah um on a professional level yes i think you know most the most important thing is i suppose you have to step into their shoes uh and see what's it like for them to come in the door um you know that's a massive brave step for for a lot of people the even to pick up the phone and make contact is, is, you know, can be a huge ordeal. So, you know, you, people have to feel comfortable in front of you and you have to build a relationship and there has to be trust and all of those things that will allow therapy to work. Um, you know, there's an early a spiritual aspect to it where you have to connect up with, with the person that you're working with. And it works both ways. And when you create that type of a safe place, I think, you know, uh, therapy can work well. How long can it take to create that safe space? Um, it's amazing after a session or two, you know, people begin to relax and people begin to, you know, you build a relationship and, you, you know, when, once a person starts relaxing and know that they're listened to and know that it's safe for them to speak, um yeah after after a couple of sessions you you begin to get into the work that that the person is there to do and but is, it's on it's on their terms yes is it primarily in the area of addiction that you work justin yes um i suppose i started off working in in uh Castlery. most of the clients were coming through the courts and some from Castlery prison and then um, I would have worked in the Ashland Centre in Ballyragish. It was residential treatment centre for 15 to 21 year olds, both male and female. And I was there for about six years and uh, I was travelling from Athlone and I was, you know, I was getting burned out. And 
Roscommon hurling joke came up and I was looking and saying, God, will I will I take a chance and go out myself privately? And that's what I done then. And so just for my own learning, I, I qualified in holistic counselling and psychotherapy as well. So I, I can work on both sides. Yes. OK. And so what is the profile of the average person that walks into your door? Um. I, because I've worked with 15 to 21 year olds, sometimes um, career guidance teachers can refer kids to me that are struggling in school around behavior or different issues that might be going on for them. And I have some clients uh, at the other end of the scale in their twilight years, right up to their 70s, you know, dependent. So it's across the board. I, maybe because I'm known from a sporting background. Uh, I have a lot of GEA people that connect up with me, but not necessarily. Sometimes it's across all sport. What tends to be going on with those younger people these days? Um, I suppose sometimes it's, it's, you know, identification and not being understood and feeling very angry and not being able to deal with that anger. And, you know, it it's often comes out from the people that they love the most, as in parents and other siblings and um, acting out, I would say, and, you know, picking up alcohol or picking up drugs and, and just drifting off the wrong way. And sometimes the difficulty is, you know, parents will get triggered and they'll get angry and, is often the situation where somebody might split the parents. So you might, you know, dad might do it one way and mom might do it another way and, you know, creates this triangle between the family. And, you know, it's like I often say, getting into a washing machine. If, if somebody's life goes into the washing machine, there's a tendency to bring three or four more into the washing machine. And suddenly you have a family spinning and that are in trouble. So, it's trying to find a pathway or a plan and trying to connect up with somebody and try to understand, you know, what's it like to be a teenager? I think that's, you know, to try and figure out what's going on for them because there's some sort of internal pain. So sometimes we just see the outside of the anger and all the behaviours, but underneath it, there's always some form of pain going on for the individual. Uh, is that the case when it comes to addiction generally? I always remember, I don't know why it stuck in my head, but uh, George Best, back on the Late Late Show days, he used to come on and do these interviews occasionally. And he would very much say his alcoholism uh, was an illness. And, and what he meant by that was there's almost just something chemical in him that just can't say no to alcohol. And yet you talked there about an underlying pain generally being the the cause. So are there some people who may have no underlying pain and, and, and just the substance just does something to them on a chemical level? Or or would you tend to feel there's always an underlying pain that they're trying to anaesthetize? Um, I, yes, I think, I, I think, you know, addiction is progressive by nature. Uh, and there is that chemical dependency that, that takes place. But, you know, I describe it a little bit like going up a conveyor belt, Joe, and, you know, when, when people pick up their first drink or their first stroke or have a bet, there's a tendency to be on this conveyor belt and over time it can progress. And, um, you know, what starts out as something social and good fun and enjoy enjoyment I think it's over time that, you know, you start drinking or using or gambling on a Friday and suddenly it goes to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then it can go to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then it sort of can resolve all your problems. They often call it a feelings disease. So depending on how you're feeling will depend on the amount of drink you drink or if you're having issues or problems. So in, in the case of alcohol, alcohol can be you know, you put your head in the sand and not deal with your problems or find a way of dealing with them. But I, I often find that from what happens between not and 12 or not, 14 or 15, uh, if there's family issues going on or if 
there's bullying or neglect or abuse or whatever is going on in a person's life and they pick up a drink or a drug, they're more likely to go up that conveyor belt much, much quicker. So it's like putting petrol on a fire, really, and they can get into addiction very, very quickly. It's interesting that, you know, there was no, in my day, there would be no treatment centre for 15 to 21 year olds. Now you probably could do with five or six treatment centres, the same as the Ashland Centre in every province. You know, so it's getting younger and younger. Mm. And if somebody's had a tricky time in the early stages of their life, is it, is it ever truly possible to resolve that and heal that? Or is it um, uh, yeah, patch it up as best we can to a, to a functional level? Um, I think when somebody goes into the addiction part, there's, there's, there's often two parts to it. And I, I've just got this experience working in, in treatment centres where, you know, the, the focus is on the behaviours and how you're living your life and the consequences of your addiction. And so you, you focus on that and you deal with that and you follow a programme. Uh, and then you would find that maybe the early stuff of childhood or, or different stuff may start coming up and a lot of people can relapse as a result of that. So there's one part of it where you have to get stabilisation and yeah. Uh, you know, so people would be solid on their feet, if you like. And then over time, when they have enough recovery behind them to be able to go back and slowly deal with what might have caused the pain in the first place. So it's a tricky balance. It yes. depends where people are at, whether they're able to do both together. Everybody is different. Uh, this is probably a tough question to answer because it's general. And I suspect the answer could be in each specific case. But say you stabilize somebody's addiction and then you go and I suppose what therapists might call, well, let's go and do the work. And you start ask getting them to talk about maybe difficult uh, chapters in their in their history. Um, talking in and of itself, does that constitute the work or is there something beyond that? If somebody talks to you at length about a difficult period in their childhood, does that somehow... Uh, put a coolant on the situation or, or is there more to it than just talking? Um, I think there's, yeah, it, it's addiction nearly takes on a life of its own. I, I think, you know, <clears throat> where alcohol might be turned out to be sociable and great fun and everything else and suddenly the relationship between the person and the alcohol changes. So, what alcohol used to do for the person doesn't do anymore and they consume more and more of it, hoping to get the same effect. And the consequences start, you know, mounting up and it starts getting worse and worse. So that's nearly a phenomenon on its own, yeah. that, that you're, the wiring system, any time I have an issue or a problem, you know, I'll think of having a drink or yeah. a trigger to go down that pathway. So... That's a, a, an addiction on its own. And what you're trying to do is trying to, like most people in addiction, the addict is probably the last person to know about it in one sense, that they're so blinded from it. But part of, you know, they often call it a disease model that part of it is denial and minimization and justification why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and it's bringing somebody into the light or bringing them into the reality of the situation, if you like, um, of the consequences of how they're living their lives. And until they see that, nothing really changes. And would yet, if they're sitting opposite you, they're there for a reason. They're, they're looking for something different. I suspect if you are working with someone who's struggling with gambling, for instance, uh, they must reach a point where there's a huge relief to be sitting in front of you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's the, the disease that will tell you that you don't have, you know, a disease. So gambling is often called the invisible disease where you don't see it. So you go to the bar and you drink X amount. Everybody knows you have a few pints on you. <clears throat> When you go to the bookie office and you lose a thousand or two thousand or next week's wages um, and you walk out, nobody knows any different. So 
it's very, very hard to read the signs and the signals of, of a gambler in a sense. And many gamblers, you know, whether they're caught by family members or they come clean for themselves, there's this massive release. There's no doubt about it that they don't have to play this game anymore, if you like, and we can start dealing with the problem. And, you know, gambling, I often find, is a very lonely thing because it's something that people do on their own or their, you know, the phone now is the, the new bookie office, if you like. And, you know, you can work away on that without anybody knowing it until, you know, two or three o'clock, four o'clock. It doesn't matter what sport uh, you can. Sometimes it's not about the sport. It's actually about the bet. Gambling would strike me as one of the trickier addictions for you and for a patient to surmount because if it's alcohol or drugs, there is perhaps a window of time from the urge to getting the alcohol or getting the drugs where you might somehow bring yourself back from the brink, whereas I reckon you could probably get a bed on within about 10 seconds. Um, Yes, yes and no, Joe. What I've often found with gamblers, once they come clean, um, they're so relieved that that recovery actually can happen pretty quickly. Right. Um, So, you know, for cocaine, the difficulty I've found, you know, a client said to me before uh, where he lives, it would be, you know, if he ordered a pizza and ordered cocaine, the cocaine would come before the pizza. Right. (laughs) <laughs> which is hard to believe you know it's it's a crazy world but but you know that's what it's like so um and that can be at two o'clock in the morning if somebody is stuck as well you know if they know the right person to ring that that it's that easy the access to it and that's very concerning that you know what i'm hearing coming in the door is that you know cocaine has nearly been normalized and you know, I do a good bit of work with GEA and I just, I suppose, just concerned and worried about GEA players of, you know, doing that or being in that place and, and trying to play sport at a high level and just the impact on their own personal lives that, you know, it's clean, it's white, it's done at the weekend, it's recreational. That's not the case for everybody. And, and that's what I mean about that conveyor belt over time somebody is going to go up the conveyor belt and, and pay a big price in their lives. So in terms of a breakdown of patients coming to you, is cocaine uh, approaching top of the list territory or is it still very much alcohol or gambling? Or uh, It's probably a combination um, of each. Somebody can have a primary addiction and a secondary addiction, um, which uh, alcohol and cocaine seem to be the ones coming together person that uses a lot of the time you'll hear that you know cocaine is the issue but they never take it on its own or wouldn't bother taking cocaine on its own it's only when they're out socializing and you know the four or five pints drank and then the urge would come for the cocaine and it would be probably back to a house party and might be friday night and it could be all day saturday you know it's this binge for 12, 14 hours and then a crash afterwards and, you know, the consequences of going back into college or going back to your job and and suffering for the next couple of days as a result of it. And, you know, the fallout of that, not just financial, in in mentally and emotionally for some people is is tough. Yes, I can imagine. And I should mention, you, you have worked with the GEA's Health and Wellbeing Committee for a number of years now. I would have thought GEA players would be afraid of their life of a drugs test, no? Um, I think it happens to us as, as uh, voluntary or involuntary. I'm not sure in in um, for inter county players, and yeah, I'm sure you know um, they would be concerned. It doesn't happen for for club players. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know it's 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 difficult to know whether that would stop them or not. But you know, I I don't believe in you know, using a big stick to stop anybody from doing anything, that's up to themselves. But certainly, I think we have a duty of care to young people of, you know, if they do get into trouble, that there's some sort of support mechanisms to help them. And, um, you know, there has to be some form of a compassionate approach um, 
to people because it's not their intention to get into trouble. It, it, it just happens. So I, you have to, you know, I admire the GEA out of all the different sports. They have a health and well-being section, which is great. And <clears throat> sometimes you would hear, you know, it's great to hear GEA players coming out talking about their issues and problems. And all of a sudden you think it's only the GEA players that are having all of these problems. But, you know, it, it's across the board. It's not a GEA problem. It's a society problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's happened in soccer and rugby and different sports as well. So I, I, I've i seen lads from, from all sides and uh, the issues and the problems are the same across the board. And Justin, when it comes to addiction, can patients go from a point of being out of control, be it with alcohol or their betting, let's park cocaine for a moment, will they forevermore have to... Uh, follow total abstinence or uh, could they get to a point where they have a social drink very much in control and they have a social bet very much in control? Um, Yeah, so it depends on the individual that's coming in the door. Um, You know, I wouldn't force anything on anybody. It's, you know, or even using labels like an alcoholic or an addict. You know, people struggle with those terms and probably puts them off coming to counselling, really. And it's trying to find something that works for the individual or works for you. And you can only be honest with yourself and see, you know, you can try uh, a harm reduction model, Joe. That's what you're talking about there, that, you know, that I can only, I'm able to drink three or four pints on a Saturday night and I leave it at that. And, you know, you can try that out and some people are able to manage it and leave it at that and that would suggest then they're not dependent on alcohol that they can take back control of it for others and they may start that and you will find in a month or two months it's back to square one again and you're in bother and the saturday is now gone to a sunday and you know the effects of the mental health and work and and family life all takes a beating and for those people, abstinence-based model is probably the best model for them. Mm. I saw you were talking to, I know we were on to you last week to arrange the interview, and on Sunday you were talking to Dermot Crow in the Sunday Independent. And uh, you had an interesting uh, line in that interview, I thought, where you said, if you don't know who you are, then that's scary sometimes. So how does the average person get to know who they are? Yeah, so... Uh, one of the things I often say is I use the front of the, my hand and I go, you know, I'm I'm Justin, I'm a counsellor, I'm married, I have kids and everything, I'm coaching and into hurling and counselling and everything is good in my life. On the back of the hand, I could be stressed, I could be anxious and depressed, I could have loads going on for me. Um, so I can show one side on the outside and on the inside it's completely different. Uh, uh, and that's the struggle in life, if you like. We, we've a tendency, I don't know, is it an Irish thing? How are you? And grand. Uh, and I could be struggling, I could be in bits, but yet I'll put the good side out. And I think we're all a bit like that. And, you know, my experience in life is, is trying to match the inside and the outside. Uh, and once they're aligned and there's a sense of being okay on the inside with yourself, I think there's a relationship we forget about ourselves as in how we relate to ourselves. Some people, you know, if you're in addiction, you're very angry with yourself because you don't like doing what you're doing. Um, So I think you have to be compassionate and be kind and, and begin to build a relationship with yourself. And, you know, if you're not getting on with yourself, you're probably not getting on with other people around you. Uh, So, I think that's where where the health part starts, that your self-esteem and self-confidence and being okay with yourself. Uh, And when you sort of heal that side of yourself, then life becomes easier. What are the common reasons people tend not to be at peace with themselves? Um, Maybe the past. Um, uh, Different issues that might be going on for them that's unresolved. it could be grief or loss in my situation. 
um, you know, was was fairly tough to deal with. And you're you're angry at God, you're angry at the world, you're angry at a lot of things. How how life is, you know, and uh, you know, it's, it's trying to accept. Someone said life is about acceptance or non-acceptance, and you know that's a journey in itself. And um, you can you you know you can flow the water flows a certain way and you can you can swim against the tide if you like and um it's much easier to go with the flow of life sometimes we don't be, and everything is going wrong for us and it's only when we make those adjustments that we go with the flow of life and um, we're talking here with justin campbell who played uh, hurling with galway in the 90s now runs his own private uh, practice and works uh, in the area of addiction amongst uh, other issues with patients. Uh, you mentioned grief there. I, I touched on the outside on the outset that your both your parents passed away when you were uh, far too young to lose them. Ten in your father's case, and your mother fell ill when you were fourteen. On the uh, whole area of grief, uh, is there an agreed ideal way for someone to grieve? Um. And, well, not for me, definitely. Um, I think you have to be ready for grief. It, it, you know, there's a ten tendency to keep pushing it down because it's so painful. Uh, and you can use alcohol or drugs or whatever you want, you know, to it becomes an escape or the addiction at some level is the painkiller, <clears throat> alcohol or drugs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so... Yeah, so there's no right or wrong way, but I, I think over time, it's like a stone in your shoe. You have to take the stone out of the shoe at some stage. Um, uh, and it's trying to find the right person and trying to um, be aware of it because we can be in denial of it. And, you know, some people are amazing. They'll, they'll carry on and not deal with it or they'll find other coping mechanisms or they'll focus on something else and they'll find a purpose in life um, and you know some people are powerfully strong and, and have great faith and <clears throat> all of those coping mechanisms um, can can help you and support you and yeah so everybody is different yeah because I, I was talking to someone who was uh, I suppose grieving and, and that um, you know that question people often ask did you give yourself time to grieve and uh, his sense was like I, I did, but I, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. You know, he was like, do I go and, and, and like uh, smell my loved one's clothes or do I do I look at photos or do I go for long walks and think about nothing but them? He's like, I, I, I don't know what to do um, to almost uh, lean into the grieving as, as, as such, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it, it feels like blocked emotional pain and it's nearly stored up in the body um, but the, it's so painful that you can't talk about it um, <clears throat> I heard somebody describing it a little bit of you know having broken ribs and walking around with the pain of broken ribs and nobody can see you with the broken ribs and I thought it was a, a good description, you know, when somebody is in pain and it's only when you recognize the pain and sit down. And, and I remember uh, I, I went to a bereavement counselor and the, you know, the, dis, the they described it like being beside the sea and that you walk in a small bit into the water up to your knees and walk back out again onto solid ground mm. and the next day or the next week when you're ready and able, you go in a little bit further uh, and you come back out back onto solid ground. And you'd be hoping over time that you're able to go into the water and swim around in it and come back out onto solid ground. Mm. Uh, and that really helped me. It, it allowed me to deal with it bit by bit and, you know, to be able to go back into pain and the loss of, of both my parents. Yes, no, I can imagine. And um, again, I know it's a delicate su subject for you and we, we, we don't need to delve too deeply into your situation. But whilst you were 
in an All Ireland final with Galway and winning All Ireland under twenty ones and and do very, doing very well on the face of it. Things obviously weren't good. And in the end, I know you spent some time in Chicago in your twenties, and then you came home and you went to the Rutland Centre uh, for for six weeks to to try and get on on top of it. Um, what what was that experience like in the Rutland Centre? I I don't know anyone who's you know been in that kind of intense program. <coughs> Um, I, I was delighted to go into it. I suppose at some level. Yeah. Um, I, I remember um, the manager at the time. It was actually over around Christmas time, and I think there was about twenty of us in at the time. And she was asking, you know, what's it like to be here at Christmas? And there's a lot of people upset and crying, and they might have small kids at home and Santa Claus. And I was pretty young. I think I was twenty six. And she asked me, what's it like for you, Justin? And I said, Jesus, I'm delighted. <laughs> and uh, everybody started laughing, like, how could you be delighted to be in a treatment centre over Christmas? And, um, you know, I I would find Christmas all right, as in you could drink away and, and hide because everybody else is drinking, but January would come and I'd be still looking for a party or still be in that mode and everybody else would be gone back to normal work and... You know, at that time, I, I would have been drinking and it wasn't a happy drinking. It was more of a, a depression, more so than anything else. There were the consequences of it. You know? So it was a tough place to be and it's a tough thing to do for anybody, but yet hugely rewarding. You begin to see other sides of you and different parts of you and you come into the reality of your life, if you like, and you have to face your demons and hopefully come out the far side of it. Yes, yeah. It's. I mean, your point a few moments ago about the relationship with self is not one we would discuss too often on the show and it's probably not something that most people in the hustle and bustle of life give too much thought to. But wouldn't it be an interesting thing if you stopped everyone and said take a minute or two here and you ask them what is your relationship like with yourself I suspect people will get quite upset in a lot of instances yeah yeah I think we're sort of programmed and we're robotic of you know I often believe that we were we think we're human doers as in you'll be doing something tonight Joe I'll be doing something tonight we'll be training we'll be doing something so we're, we're going to work, we're doing, but yet we're human beings. And it's how we're being is what matters really and truly. So if I do this, then I'll be happy. Or if I do that, then I'll be happy. And, you know, th that fades away. It's about being okay with yourself and being accepting of yourself and being content with yourself and, you know, far from perfect and, and be okay with all the imperfections as well. So... I do believe we're made up of parts and, you know, we have to accept life on life's terms and, and that's a challenge. And, you know, I, re I remember listening to Brian Cody and uh, he talked about, you know, tr whatever you face in life, face it and, and trying to come out the far side of it. That's the biggest challenge in our lives, whether it's on the pitch or it's off the pitch. And, um you know, these things happen pretty quickly on the field of play or off the field of play and it's how we adapt to them. That's the word to use. You know, how can we adapt to what's happening? Uh, and that's everybody's challenge. And I, I just, you know, human experience and human life is part of it is suffering and, and struggle. But maybe we need to do that in order to know what our lives are about really and truly. And They often say you spend 40 years of your life, um, you know, you get married, you have kids, you have the house, you have the job, and you're, you're looking out. And then you stop someday and you go, what's this all about? And you spend the next 40 years looking in mm. and trying to figure it all out. And I think what's amazing about the addiction side of things, it forces you to look in no matter what age you were. So some people, when they're young, I, I would be saying to them, isn't it great to catch this now rather than in your 60s or 70s and you've struggled all your life? So, you know, there's a lot, to, even though it might be traumatic and it's tough to face up to stuff, 
still highly rewarding if you can do that. And it takes courage and bravery to do that. It's not too easy, which yet is probably the only way out. I have no doubt, Justin, there are people listening to our conversation right now and they're worried about a partner or a son or a daughter or a brother and a sister and they suspect gambling issue or alcohol issue or drug issue or, or, or some addictive uh, issue. And as you said, it's quite difficult for maybe the person in trouble to face it and or, and, and, and to realise they have a problem. Is there any best practice or, or advice for those closest to someone who's struggling? Um. I would say it was somebody that's struggling with alcohol, for instance, there's no point in challenging them when they have alcohol on board. Um, and sometimes people are split in a family of how to approach it. And, and they're probably, you know, better off because they're all impacted by somebody's addiction as well. And they can actually struggle more because if somebody's an addiction, they have the drink or the drug or the bet to deal with their lives. But the person that's looking on can actually suffer as much or if actually more. So I, I would be inclined to sort of have a family meeting and sort of get some professional help and get a map of how do we approach this. Uh, and sometimes when you have two or three people singing off the one hymn sheet, that can be very powerful if they know how to approach it. And, um, you know, the, the big stick and the anger and everything else only makes things worse. And I think, you know, putting your arm around somebody and being compassionate with them and, you know, asking them, you know, can this has to change or, you know, what's our alternative here? Can we do something about it? And sometimes that approach is probably the best approach. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work either. But it, it's definitely something has to change. I often say if nothing changes, well, then nothing changes. Family stays the same or the person stays the same. So something must change. Mm. So I've done a few Tony Robbins uh, life coaching courses, and he would say, you know, if your approach doesn't work, well, then change your approach. And if that approach doesn't work, well, then change your approach. So in other words, you keep changing your approach until something changes. Uh, just a, a final thought. So you've been in yeah, dressing rooms with uh, lots of young people in your time. And now you're, you're I think, obviously treating young people. And I, I think talking to uh, teams uh, of, of a young age, as well. Does anything strike you generationally has much changed from your day to what you see amongst young people now? We, we all uh, like to compare generations and talk about profound uh, shifts. I, I sometimes wonder if it's a touch overblown, but then generations probably do change for various reasons. What have you observed from your own days versus maybe what's going on now? Um, yeah, I it's an interesting question, Joe. It's hard to answer. Um, I, I still, you know, when when you go into a college or do a talk in a school or, or um, in a GEA club um, and, you, and you talk about that being OK with yourself and a sense of self and a lot of young people because of social media and um, I should be this way or I should be that way and... Um, you know, the pressures of stresses of how I look and it's all external versus internal. Um, and I think that's the problem of 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 trying to be this person on the outside and, and um, it doesn't add, you know, it's not on the inside. Something is something different on the inside and there lies the struggle of it. Um, but people are the same in a sense if you talk their language and stuff they may have different ways of getting away from it and they may act differently and do things differently through social media and that and that's how they interact with each other. That's probably the biggest difference I find. But when you're talking about life and life's experiences and you, and you peel it back, there is no difference. Yeah, I think we're all the same. Mm. Um, uh, and I think young people can get that too and get something out of it for themselves. It, I, I can see people in the audience, 
you know, picking up exactly what I'm saying and, and they can completely identify with it of how they're living their lives, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, hurling is still a big part of your life and your identity and you mentioned doing a bit of work, work at Roscommon and I presume you still catch every Galway match. Uh, trying my best, yeah. And, uh, How much counselling yeah, will Galway uh, supporters need this year? Say that again, Joe. How much counselling will Galway supporters need this year? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have an appointment made with Henry Shefflin. He's coming to see me next week. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. Um, I, I, I actually think, you know, Limerick are brilliant and they look brilliant already. And, and that's concerning for every other county. Um, I think I think all we have to get it right and to get their full team back can can give them a right good game whether they believe in themselves or not is another day's work. It'll be interesting to know. Clare could be dangerous. Cork, I, I think Limerick are you know are, are streets ahead. They are probably coming back to us, but yeah, uh, it'll take a fair team to take them. Yeah, and the quality of hurling that we see these days, uh, I mean, the skill levels and the physicality and the fitness, It's. Uh, do you enjoy it as much as any era? I know the 90s was so full of colour and, and you were obviously very much a part of that, but it does feel like what we see on a hurling pitch these days at times is take your breath away. And it's scary, you know, the speed of it and they're like gladiators out on the pitch, you know. Um, I in sometimes I often wonder about the real risky, skillful hurler that was eleven and a half stone weight and yeah. and you know, would he last today or would he make the great day? And <clears throat> I often tell that John Try I, I would have hurled with John in, in Chicago and different places. And uh his skill level would be excellent, but would he make today's great? It's hard to know, you know. So it's all about speed and um power and which is a bit, you know, worrying that, that the skill of the game isn't as important now. And that would be a worry for me, I suppose. Mm. But, but um, look, at, we, we have a great game and it's a great spectacle. There's no doubt about it. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was, it was absolutely fascinating conversation and, and to, you know, get your wisdom on a whole host of topics. So much appreciated, Justin. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much for asking me. Thank you. That's Justin Campbell joining us on the show this evening like I alluded to just there, a Galway hurler in the 90s and uh, now very much working in his own private practice in the area of addiction uh, in particular.